Matthew chapter 16, and I'll take it up with verse 13. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples a question. Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, and others say Elijah, and others say Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And he said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood does not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And then he strictly charged the disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ. So the location is Caesarea Philippi. A little bit of historical background to this. It was a Roman city that was built within the borders of Israel. We need to pay attention to this because there's some important uh, things that we ought to know. It was overlooking the Jordan Valley, and it was a beautiful place. There was a natural spring coming up, and one of kind of the tourist attractions, if we could use this word, one of the things that they would have been known for was this massive rock wall where the Romans over the years had built temple after temple after temple to commemorate God after God after God. It's basically a, a wall of fame that was set up for the gods. Now, the newest temple as we have it around the time of Jesus had been built for Caesar. And as we understand it from history, actually had a title, the Son of God, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. That was inscribed in this temple. There's a spring that came out from it, and sacrifices would be offered around this spring to people who worshiped other gods. And Jesus brings his disciples together at this important place for an important moment. He brings his disciples together for this ancient sin city, yeah? I mean, what happened in Caesarea stayed in Caesarea. It was the, it was the old school Las Vegas kind of place. And Jesus brings his people around to make an announcement he draws them out into conversation, and you can see how it starts to flow there. Who do people say that I am? Right? And you can just imagine. Let your imagination fill up. Wall of fame to all the other gods. A spring where sacrifices would be offered to all kinds of different idols. Who do people say that I am? That's what Jesus wants to say. And Peter gets it. Jesus tells us the only way you're able to say it is it comes from the Father. You can't come up with this stuff on your own. I like to think no one walking down Broadway tonight is going to guess Romans chapter 3. It's going to be like shown to you somehow, yeah? And he says, well, you're the Christ. You're the Son of the living God. And Jesus is like, you get it. You understand. And he says, on this rock, I will build my what? What does he say? Church. What is the rock, though? Um, Roman Catholic theology would report that what Jesus is saying right here is this is, this is where we have the first line of papal succession. He, Jesus is saying, on this, on you, Peter, making you the Pope through this, and on you, I'm going to build my church. So we get the notions of, that's where the Roman Catholic theology gets the ideas of, of papal succession and papal infallibility. It comes right here. So that Peter, from now on, the Pope is going to be able to speak ex cathedra on behalf of God. I mean, surely that doesn't seem to make a whole lot of sense. Jesus is going to call him Satan a few sentences later. I mean, let's go easy on that one. Maybe, maybe he has something else in mind. I mean, maybe Jesus, maybe they're at the rock wall. I don't know. I'm using my imagination. They're certainly in the town. Is Jesus saying, on this rock, I'm going to build my church. Like all the other nations have attempted to build their church, we're going to go for a geographical center. And on this place, I'm going to be named King of Kings and Lord of Lords. I'm going to show you I'm the better Caesar. Doesn't seem to be it either. I mean, we're over here in Nashville. We're not in Caesarea right now. Seems to be he's pointing at the confession. On this confession, you're the Christ. You're the son of the living God. On the backbone of that confession, Jesus says, I will build my church. I mean, let the, that hang above us as just a banner as we reflect tonight. Jesus says, I will build this. Good words for us to think about as we're opening up this new chapter of ministry together, Right? Lots of ideas, lots of energy. We have these words hanging over us. I will build my church, says Jesus. Amen? So what is the church? Well, here's the definition. The church is not a religious club or a social action group. Of course it's not. Jesus says he's building it. The church is the people of God, established by the gospel, chosen by grace. 
And we are empowered to, by the Spirit to be an embassy and picture of God's kingdom through our worship and love. So we can kind of chew on this a little bit. So it, it would be wrong to think of what happens here. This is kind of like the religious club that gets together on Wednesdays and Sundays. That's, that's not it. That's not it. We're not a social action group. We come together. We're going to bring action. No, that's, that's not it. We're the people of God. That's actually one of the most dominant ways your, whole, your Bible, Old Testament and New, talks about the church. How's the, what does the Bible say about us? The Bible would say the church is the people of God. You're God's people. You're those that belong to God. We're empowered by the Spirit, as we considered last week, to be an embassy and a picture of God's kingdom through what? Well, through our worship of God and through our love, our love of God and our love of one another and our love for the world indeed. So here comes the fancy schmancy word, ecclesiology. That's kind of what's happening right here. We're studying the doctrine of the church, right? Two, uh, two Hebrew words are important. One is a transliterated word called kahal, and the other one is adah. In the Old Testament, these words refer to the congregation or the assembling or the gathering of the people of God. These are the words that we have in mind when the authors pick it up and they start using this word in the Greek called ekklesia. You can see where it comes from. Ekklesia is a compound word. Kaleo means to call. Ek means out of. The church is quite literally those group of people who are called out of. Out of what? Well, out of their former way of life out of their sin, out of their love for foreign gods. They're called out of that and into the worship of the one true living God. 114 times your New Testament says, this is the ecclesia. The church is the called out ones. You've been called out from that former way. You've been called to the one true living God. You've been called out of everybody who you could ever put up on a wall of fame to the other gods. You've been called to the one true living God. A couple of important categories we could keep in mind. At one point, this draft was actually uh, a page and a half just of these categories, and my mind started to get numb, and I figured yours would too. So I changed it up a little bit. This is compressing it down a, a bit. Um, a couple of categories we can have in mind. When you think about the church, you could think about how the, the, the church is both universal and local. Do not misunderstand me. We're not talking about universalism. We're not talking about this wild notion that everybody ends up in we're talking about the fact that the church is composed of these, these two different dynamics. The universal church refers to all Christians in all, in all places and in all times. Right? So the, the church indeed is universal in the sense that well, there's Christians gathered in this room tonight. I bet there's Christians gathered in another hall somewhere else in the state of Tennessee right now. There's Christians that will gather later on tonight in Los Angeles and around the world it goes. But so the church has a universal dimension to it. When we speak of the church, we don't have to name all the individual local churches. We can name the universal church. We can say the church, and we refer to all true believers in Jesus Christ everywhere. Yet another way that we can talk about the, the church, we do speak in terms of localities. We speak in terms of, you know, that church that meets at the corner of 7th and Broadway. We speak of Nashville first. We can speak of the church like that too. Important categories we can keep in mind. Um, one that's not listed here, um, I probably, probably should have, but I had a little formatting issue. I hate it when the words fall off the, the page. Um, th this, uh, this, this other thing, um, you could think of the church as an organism and an organization. These words aren't original to me. Uh, one of my favorite theologians, his name is a Dutch guy named Abraham Kuyper, K-U-Y-P-E-R. He would say that the church is both an organism and an organization. That really helps me when I think about that. So there's going to be parts of what it is to be the church. We are this, we're this people. We're living. And as an organism, we can be healthy or we can be unhealthy. We can be fit or we can be unfit. We can be busy in the right ways or we can be getting up to no good. We're an organism. We can, we're going to be living and moving. And it also has important organizational aspects as well. It's part of what it means to be the church. Uh, it, it's probably best summarized in, in two or three marks. Um, this is my third. I'll tell you what people think should be the third. I'll give you this one. There's three marks of the church. Here's the question. What separates what's happening right here from a group of college students just across the way gathered up in, well, I, mean, I guess they're about finished, right? Um, it, when they gather in the dorms at Belmont. I mean, what separates that activity from this activity? How do you, how do you delineate? How do you differentiate? Is there some sort of classification we can have? that helps us understand what's church and, I mean, yes, they are the church, but is that an organized church in the way that this is an organized church? You can look for three different marks. You know you have a true church when you have at least three things going on. You have the preaching of the word. Uh, some theologians uh, feel the need to say the right preaching of the word. I guess there could be wrong preaching of the word. You have the right preaching of the word. 
You have the sacraments, also understood to be the ordinances. That's the Lord's Supper and baptism. And then I think you have this very important third category. You identify as the church. You, 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 you recognize, like, as we're here, no, 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 like, this is a thing. We are Nashville first, like, as we gather in here right now. That would separate other activity. I mean, it's totally possible to, to be, you know, to have some students on the quad over there at Vandy. Uh, one guy has a guitar on his knee. The other one's opening up the words. Somebody does a reading. Somebody does a song. Somebody does a prayer. I mean, you could mistake, like, is that a church? I mean, they, they might have the right teaching and sharing of the word. Look, they could even, you know, do uh, the Welches and some bread. But um, if they don't have that last bit, we would say that's not a church. They're, they're, not, they're not claiming to be. That's actually really helpful right? Think about everything that's not required to be the church, right? I mean, think of all the Christians in all the places that don't have anything more than this, and they're the true church. Underground church in China, full of these few activities, true and proper churches. Church is made up of uh, two officers. We have these two biblical categories. On one hand, you have the pastors, the elders, the overseers, interchangeable terms here. Uh, some churches will refer to them as pastors. Other churches will refer to them as elders. Even other churches will refer to them as overseers. Interchangeable right here, responsible for the preaching and the leading of the church. And, and then we have deacons, of course. Our New Testament tells us in 1 Timothy and in Titus, we learn that the office of pastor, elder, overseer is reserved for, for uh, rightly ordained and trained men. And then we see that the office of deacons is open to both men and women, clearly stated in Scripture. We see Phoebe's a deacon mentioned at the end of Romans. And we have this one goal, one goal of the church, fill the earth with people who worship God in every dimension of life. One goal. Like, this is it. Everything else is, I mean, it's fine as long as it only helps us do that, only feeds us in this. Doesn't need to distract. This is the one goal. This is our one thing. So we considered a couple weeks ago um, what it means to be made in the image of God. God looks at his first image bearers in Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 and 28. And what did he tell them to do? People who know God, people who love God, people who worship God. What was the original invitation from God? Spread out now and fill the earth with worshipers. It's right there on the first page of your Bible. It gets restated in Matthew chapter 28 in the Great Commission. It's what we're supposed to do. Know God, love God, be changed by God, and fill the earth with people who worship God. That's the one goal. So many more categories we could go through. Let's, let's get into this next bit right here. Let's, let's, let's think in terms of these different metaphors, okay? Think about these different metaphors that the Bible gives us for, for who or other what uh, the, the, the church is. Um, we could, I, I think I skipped one. We missed the, the four attributes. One, holy, Catholic, and apostolic. Let me, let me try to tick those boxes just right fast. Uh, we, do think, we do speak of the church as one. Um, there's not like eight billion churches. There's one church. There's ultimately one church of God in the world. United, this one body of Christ is ultimately united. The church is holy already sanctified, being made perfect. We're not looking for holy perfection. We are looking for a holy direction or a holy arc or telemetry on the church, set apart for God's purposes, yet still struggling with sin. That is how we understand holiness. Catholic or the Catholicity of the church. We aren't talking about the, the Catholic church. We're talking about a, the group of people committed to the Great Commission and advancing the purposes of God in the world. And we are saying the church is apostolic. We're founded on the apostles founded on the apostles' teaching, as given to us time and time again throughout the New Testament. This is the church, one, holy, Catholic, apostolic. These are the church, identified by these three marks, led by these officers to accomplish this one goal. Right, let's dive into a few metaphors, okay? This is probably the big one. This is the dominant one. What is the church? The Bible says the church is God's people. Church is God's people. Interesting. So the church isn't a place? You got to think on that. It's like, well, no, the church can, of course, be a place. But, but, but what is it that makes a house a home? It's a family. When a family fills a place, when a family goes about family business, it's a family that makes a house a home. So think about it. A church may occupy a building, but the church is a people, not necessarily a place. Of course, we call this a church. This indeed, it, it is a church in the sense that it's, it's possessed by a family, a family of people that self-identify as the church on 7th and Broadway. We, we have the preaching of the word. We, we go through the sacraments. Um, we, we practice our life together and we identify as one. So yes, we have this arranged, but think about it. 
if for some, like perish the thought, if for some wild, wild way, um, it's all of this facility just ceased to exist somehow, it was taken from us, the church would not go away because the church is a people. And we can meet in a pile of rubble in the parking lot or we can meet in this room right here, but the church is necessarily a people. So we gather, we, we enjoy filling up beautiful spaces like these, but we're a people. And God's building together, think about this, God's building a spiritual house with his people. This is how it's described to us in 1 Peter chapter 2. As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen as precious, you yourselves like living stones are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood and to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So building language is actually used, but the building language is applied to people. You're a living stone and you're one too, and so are you and so are you over there. We're a living stone that God himself is putting together to make a living temple for his spirit to live in. One of the many metaphors for what the church is. So the church is a people, not necessarily a physical house, but a, but a spiritual people that God is building in the world. So when referring to the church, we can refer to people. And sometimes we can refer to the building like too much. We, could, we should actually remember, like it's the people, it's you, it's you, it's me, it's us together, it's our life together. We can encourage one another by remembering that we are a people. Now as a people, God is making us, you just heard it, into a priesthood of believers. God raised us up as pre God raised up priests in the Old Testament to deal with sin. The priest function is kind of the middle management who stood between God and sinful humanity. They oversaw animal sacrifices that God prescribed in order to mediate the sins of people. All throughout the Old Testament, the priesthood was never intended to fully sustain the relationship between holy God and sinful humanity, but it was giving us an imagination for two important dynamics. Number one, the great high priest, Jesus Christ, who would be both the priest over his own sacrifice. And number two, to help us understand the function of God's people that we get to play in the world as intermediaries, standing in the gap between people and God, mediating that relationship. What is God doing? God's making a kingdom of priests who's going to gather for refreshment. He's going to scatter them through the city so we could be a means of mediating that relationship to God as we share the gospel and as we do good deeds. In this, Jesus is our great high priest. Jesus is our great high priest. He went to the cross. As we saw in John 10 over the last two weeks, the shepherd gave his life for the sheep. He is the sin-substituting lamb of God. Through Jesus, that office of priesthood was perfected for all time. This is the argument of Hebrews 7 and 10. And then it's given over to us. God would say, you become a priesthood now. You go in the world. Well, the sacrifices that we offer, they are not redemptive. What happened on the cross was sufficient. These are offerings that we give to God, intending to draw attention and affection to God. God's people then are referred to as a holy priesthood. Through Jesus, God is creating a people to live lives of holiness and distinction. In order to be made right with God, people have to come to God, namely through the great high priest, Jesus Christ. But it is interesting. The great high priest, Jesus Christ, has scattered priests throughout the world to help him in his work. We also see we're the body of Christ. Another metaphor for what it means to be the church. Third one down the page. God considers himself to be a groom. He considers the church to be his bride. And when you consider Ephesians chapter 5, it's, it's all over it from verse 21 to verse 33. You're, you're thinking right there in those first few verses, verse 21 and 23, Paul tells us why marriage is important. This is why marriage ought to be between a man and a woman. This is why it's so integral to the storyline of the Bible. Here's the thinking. In marriage, the husband is going to image God in a specific way, and the wife is going to image God in a specific way. How this is going to work, the husband is going to mirror Jesus to spouse, neighbors, and watching world. The husband is going to mirror Jesus by showing the self-sacrificial love by which he lays down his wife life for the welfare of his wife. And then she is going to image Christ back to him, to the watching neighbors, and to the rest of the world as well. She's going to show us other aspects of God as she represents the way in which the church responds to the loving, sacrificial leadership and headship of her husband. 
Here's what makes it really wild. According to the Bible, you and I might think the relationships that we have here in this world, this is the real. And we just kind of think God's doing something else and foreign in this relationship between Jesus and the church. But Romans chapter five turns the whole idea on its head and says the real is the relationship of Jesus and the church. And what we have in our marriages all across this room, this is the shadow of that. That's why this is this was important. This is why we hold marriage in high regard. That's why I want to see healthy marriages. This is why in the days ahead, we want to be laboring to see lots of marriages here in this church. We want lots of shadows of this marriage filling up our city. Well, in this, in this, you can, you can see how marriage, love, and sex would be some of God's favorite descriptors to describe the relationship between him and his people. Now, some people would cringe with the idea of using the metaphor of sex to describe our relationship with God, but just journey with me a little bit in this one. This is because we have divorced the physical from the spiritual dimensions of love from one another, and we have created phantoms of the two that is impossible to obtain. God intends for the expression of sex to have a full dual meaning, both physical and spiritual. So understood this way, God repeatedly describes his desire to be united with people would be in the fullness and unadulterated version of a physical and a spiritual union of two people together. So think with me on this. God desires the most close form of giving himself to a people and his people giving himself to them where there is protection, where there is security, where there is affirmation, and where there is joy that can only be found when the two parties are equally vulnerable with one another. And God is saying, this is the kind of relationship that I want to have with you. So the church then, as such, the church then, what is this? This is the church. We are a bride waiting for our wedding day and beautifying ourselves for it. I know sisters, you can imagine, brothers, just let's labor to get this into our heads a little bit. This is a bit weird to think about, isn't it? Right? So all you sisters who've gotten married before, you know what it was like, right? You were on the diet. You know, you were doing the things. You were looking after yourself every day. You're ticking the box, right? I mean, it's not too dissimilar for what the bride is doing, making ourselves ready for Jesus. And we see this in Ephesians chapter 5. So then when the picture comes together, it sounds like this. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of the water with the word, that he might present the church to himself with splendor, without any spot, without any wrinkle, without any blemish or any such thing. Simply the church is someone Jesus loves like a groom loves his bride. The bride is someone who's keeping herself safe and sure, and she's making herself ready for her groom. It's a metaphor for how God would understand our relationship and who we are. We saw it over the last two weeks. I won't spend as much time here. A flock under shepherds. Just the last one on this page as you turn it over. We're like sheep. We're like sheep. Jesus is the good shepherd, fulfilling all of the pastor leader responsibilities that God had for the people of Israel. Jesus had compassion for his people because they looked like sheep without a shepherd. He came to give abundant life to his sheep by indeed laying down his life for his sheep. So God provides shepherds for our souls. And this is one of the reasons why we need the church. God has designed us to where we need to be led and we need to be cared for by another. So think about it. God intends for your soul to be cared for and nurtured by a pastor shepherd. This is one of the reasons why this church invests great resource in developing a team of pastors and shepherds because it's going to take a lot. We're, we're quite the size flock. We've got quite a few things going on in it. So in fact, the word pastor is almost synonymous for shepherd so much that we actually use the word pastoral to refer to the herding of animals, don't we? Pastors then, they're to feed the sheep with the word and sound doctrine. That's Titus chapter 1, verses 9 and 10. Here in this opening frame of ministry together, this is why we've even done this first of all things. Let's have some time to get the right doctrine in order. So when false doctrine comes in, we know how to prevent what could lead astray. Acts chapter 20, verses 29 and 31. They should lead people with godly example. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 7. They should equip the saints to do the work of ministry. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 12. They should wisely direct the affairs of the church. That's 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 17. Pastors are to care for people, looking to their great shepherd, Jesus, who's the great shepherd over them all. The under shepherds, they look to Jesus, they examine his model of leadership, they turn around and they try to do the best they can with that in the world. The church is a multicultural community, multicultural community. God's building a diverse community. 
And it needs to be said time and time again where racism and classism are major obstacles to the gospel. It must be stated again and again and again. God is not a tribal deity of a select group of people. This is what makes us unique. One of the many things, unlike other religions, Christianity is inclusive of people from all backgrounds, from all parts of the earth, from all ethnicities, from all nations, from all cultures. No other religion in the world is inclusive as this. You have to believe in Jesus to get in, so no other religion is exclusive as this, but it is simultaneously the most inclusive and exclusive religion this world has ever seen or had to put up with. All throughout the biblical story, God is forming a people to be his special people. From Genesis to Revelation, God is always in the business of forming a people to be his prized possession, who he will show his character to, he will show his worth to, he will heal them deeply, he will shape them to be like him, and then he will work through those people. That will be his agency to where he can help other people in the world find that life as well. Well, this makes sense then. This is what God's doing from from Genesis to Revelation God is doing everything for his good and, and for his glory and for our good as well. This means the church is a place for all people, and we say it as much as many weeks as we can. You are welcome here. And this is why, this is why Jesus had to pray so much for unity in John 17. Right before the cross, what does he pray for? If he imagines, if we're able to achieve the level of unity that we're called to here, we're gonna need a lot of it. Because it's not going to be just a few of us that all look the same and sound the same. There's going to be different folks around. And we're going to need to work out. We're going to need God to work this out for us. How are we going to love with one another and go with one another? You can see it right there. The church is the body of Christ. Christ is the head. Watch this. I'm not the head. Watch this. Our, Our committees aren't the head. Our trustees aren't the head. Christ is the head. Christ is the head of the church. He's in charge, right? This is Colossians chapter 1, verse 18. Christ is the head of the church, not a council, not some organization, not some pope, not an agency, not a convention of people. Christ is the head of the church. This means then that the church should be led of a team of qualified people ultimately looking to the head Jesus and turning around and doing the best they can with the rest of them. Christ is the head. That would make you and me the body parts. And each of us has a role to play. Every, every member has a gift and every gift is important and everybody has a role to play. So if we were, if like, think of your body, right? I mean, that, that thing can be running well or can not be running well. Right? You can be running fast, you can be running slow. You can be healthy or you can be unhealthy. So it is with the church. We're a body. Every single pe- person who's a piece of this, who's looking up to Jesus together, we all have integral parts. We, we need one another. And we all have a role to play. Every person has a ministry for, to fulfill. Every member is a minister to God in the world. You remember you're a priest. God has called us, God has called some to be equippers, to step back from the front line of the work, to kind of obsess about how are we going to equip the rest of them to accomplish God's mission in the world. Christ is the head and we are the body parts. We are living in the kingdom of God. That's another way you can say it. Jesus taught us to pray, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. We're the people of God in the world, living in the presence and the power of God. I need to get to these last two. We're in exile, we're a sojourner, we're a pilgrim, we are indeed aliens. Listen, it's possible some of us feel this in different ways than others. Now, it actually be a good thing if we, could, if we could be there and we could have like a diversity of experience among us. There are times when the church feels like we are strangers in a strange land. And there could very well be a significant angle on our witness in the days ahead as we need to embrace the, in, and we need to embrace the strangeness of what all of this actually is. We, we, this, this is a bit strange. And the Bible descri- describes the role of God's people in the world in, as, stra- in, as strangers. Think about this. Nearly one-third of your Bible was written when the people of God were going through the exile experience. It sounds like we ought to be experiencing what it's like to be on the outside if one-third of Scripture is given to us to equip us for that experience. God's people spend a lot of their life being marginalized. Spend a lot of their life on the outside looking in. Psalm 105 describes the, the nature of God's people journeying through the world as a sojourner. Many people throughout church history, especially the pilgrims, they did, uh, pilgrims, the Puritans made much of the pilgrim theme. Like maybe the pilgrims had it too, I don't know. Figure that out. The scripture which emphasizes the unique passerby of the Christian experience in the world. So maybe you feel like you don't quite fit in. The way you live for Jesus in your workplace, you, you're doing your best to represent Jesus in a way that relates and makes sense to the people around you, but you feel like you're on the outside of them and you're on the outside of that. 
One third of scripture is given to help us to deal here. We are indeed exiles. We're sojourners. We're pilgrims. We're aliens. And as unsettling as that can be, think about how freeing that actually is. We're not worried about getting too comfortable. We realize we're just passing through. We're just on our way through a different sort of wilderness towards a different sort of promised land in the end. These last two are important. The church indeed is the army of God, not the kind of army that we typically think or know. Uh, The church is an army, might be either very unpopular or very misunderstood. It's unpopular for some because the church is misunderstood narrow-mindedly as as, as, as being a bit of a tyrant in the world, a bit of a bully. For others, the idea of an army is increasingly unfashionable. Like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I mean, let's, let's mute that theme a little bit. It's like talking about us as an army, like getting in our little castle in 7th Broadway. Like, we're an army. Oh, think about it with me, though. Some mistake this idea for the issue of, of warfare, thinking we're trying to take down an opponent. They believe that the positions of power and strawman arguments make the greatest weapons. For the opponent's, We think, oh, the opponents are people. No, the opponents are not people. The opponents are powers and principalities in the high places. So think about it with me. We are indeed, whether we realize it or not, we are the army of the Lord. We are wielding the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, and we wage a unique kind of warfare. God is praised as the Lord of hosts and the Lord of army 278 times in the Bible. He's praised as the Lord of the army more times than you have the word church, actually twice as much. So what are some metaphors to understand what we have? Warfare language and warfare imagery is actually given to us to help us understand who God would see us to be. God wants us to understand our life. It ought to have aspects to it where it feels like a bit of a warfare. Our armor is the whole armor of God, Ephesians 6, 10 to 20. The only weapon we possess is the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And Jesus had promised to build His church, and the gates of hell won't overcome it. That was Matthew chapter 16, verse 18. But think about this interesting idea with me. The gates are a defensive weapon. So what is Jesus saying? Here is Jesus saying He's going to build His church. He's lacing in the warfare imagery for us. And Jesus' promise is this. I am going to do something in the world and it is going to be so powerful that the defensive apparatus of hell, it will not be able to stop the battering ram of the church from coming in and from taking ground that used to belong to the evil one. Jesus promised to build this. In addition to this, the flock is going to be protected by shepherds. Paul instructed his his young shepherd, young Pastor Timothy, to take up his sword and to wage war. To take up the word and to wage war. That's 1 Timothy 1, verse 18. As he endured as a good soldier. That's 2 Timothy 3, verse 8. All the while, our war, it's not against people. We war against powers. We war against principalities. And the goal of our conflict, the goal of our conflict is love and liberation. In our individual lives, in our individual lives, holiness and expectation ought to mark us as we go to war, not a sense of doom and gloom. We don't make the mistake of believing that this world is our home. We recognize that God's good design has been distorted. We recognize that a great restoration project is underway. We work to liberate souls from the bondage to darkness. We are fighting not against people, but principalities and powers that hold them captive. And in all of this, the church engages out of love for God, love for one another, and love for the good world that God created. So finally, let's bring this all into a conclusion with this idea of a launch pad. And this will send us into our discussion or launch us into our discussion, if you will. Um, The church is God's plan A for the salvation of the world and there is no B, all right? This isn't some afterthought. This isn't like Adam and Eve start start nibbling on the fruit and the Trinity's like, what are we gonna do? And one of them's like, church, let's do church. No, this was planned. This was planned for. God's plan from the foundation of the world, it is indeed a great mystery, Ephesians 1 and Ephesians 3, they speak to this. And God's plan is to change the world through his church. So let's think in terms of cultural orientation right here. There are three ways that we could understand our relationship to the world around us. Now, go easy on me. All three of these are going to break down, but you see what I'm saying here. You could think of the church as a cruise liner. 
Maybe some of us do. I don't know. Some people view the church as a cruise liner and think about what this, what this experience of church, how this would norm us and shape us. Well, the goal of a cruise is to be happy. The guests, they spend lots of money to be secure and comfortable and to have things where every one of their needs can be met. Guests on the cruise liner, they have, really, real, they have little concern for the other people who are not on the boat because they've punched their ticket, they've paid their price, they're fine, they're safe. People who view the church in this way, they may even go and visit faraway lands on something like a mission trip, might even behave the same way that cruise line people uh, uh, behave when they're at port. Their, their missions, if you will, are like shoppers walking along a port city. They love the shops, they eat the food, they take some selfies, and then they leave all the while oblivious to the poverty and injustice that's only a few blocks away. And maybe that's not it. Maybe there's another kind of boat. And maybe we think, well, that ain't it. The church is a battleship. Some people view the church as a battleship that exists for the purpose of destroying things that could oppose it. This view of the church, it views the environment it lives in as hostile in every way. Every, everyone on the battleship, they're always in wartime alert. There's a wartime anxiety. And I know I'm kind of hurting myself. I gave you the whole warfare metaphor. And now here I am with this. But everyone is there all the time. Those other characteristics don't norm the people on the boat. There's a sense of doom and gloom in everything. Culture wars, they must be won or they must be lost. In this view, the church exists to oppose and destroy everything that could threaten its existence. So think about this. People who oppose the church, though they don't understand, they are seen as enemy combatants and treated by the church as such. How about a better way? The church, my dear friends, the church is an aircraft carrier. Not running life-destroying missions in the world, but running life-saving missions in the world. What God has done, God is graciously for the good of the streets around us. God has parked an aircraft carrier at the corner of 7th and Broad. This biblical view of the church is one in which the world is lost, marooned, and it needs help. Rescuing people, they load up onto the boat with rescuing objectives. People are lost, people are dying, people are hurting is what you hear in the halls of the boat. People are not imprisoned by other people. Instead, people are held captive by principalities and powers. It's teams of people coming together to strategize. How are we going to break through the powers? How are we going to break through the principalities? How are we going to break people out? And through the image of a high-powered aircraft carrier coming in and launching life-saving missions over there and a life-saving project over there. Someone radios in from the back. There's 50 over here that need a boat. And they're launching every work necessary to scoop up and to save as many people around. And I mean, you've been here longer than I have, right? So I mean, does this feel like a cruise ship? Does it feel like a battleship? Or does it feel like a life-saving aircraft carrier? I think we gotta figure that out, don't we? And maybe there's some of our aspects where we're built like a bit of a cruise ship. Maybe that's like dismantling some of that stuff and finding a way to put down a runway deck so we can start launching some life-saving missions off of it, right? Maybe there's a way we can take some of our, our battleship gear Maybe we can start repurposing that for some other purposes and other missions. My friends, it comes into this. I need to shut up. Here it is. The church exists for the foundation. The, the church exists from the foundation of the world. This is God's idea. And the church exists for the sake of the world. Hear me on this. God does not have a mission for his church. God has a church for his mission. And his mission is to fill the earth with the knowledge of his glory like the water covers the bottom of the ocean floor. That's what God's up to. And God creates a people and gives them lots of different ways they can understand who they are and what this whole thing is like. But our goal is to join God in his goal and to be a part of his purposes and what he is doing, right? So as a life-saving aircraft carrier, we understand we are the army of God this might feel a little strange. No one else is thinking like this, but we're living in a, his kingdom. We're citizens of this country living in his kingdom. We recognize we all have a body. We're all part of the body of Christ. There's important roles to play on the boat all around. It's a multicultural community. You'll be at a switch getting ready to do a thing. You'll turn over and he's like, where'd you come from? It's like, y'all picked me up 20 miles ago. It's like, come on, man. And here we go. And we're a flock under a shepherd. There's people giving org or organization to the rest of the organism on the boat. 
There's hope and there's joy. We're, we're working hard, not out of a sense of fear, but out of, as, as if we were a bride waiting on our groom to come and take us home. We're, we're thinking we're part of a priesthood of believers. This is what God's doing. We are the church. We're the people of God in the world. We don't exist for us. We exist for God and the welfare of the people around us. That's what I think, at least. So time for us to have a conversation around the tables. A few ideas to get us started. Our friends from choir, thank you so much for being here tonight. Um, we are free to break. We're going to have a conversation around the tables for just a few minutes. Talk that over. Go ahead and get through the hard questions there, okay? And then we'll get back. We'll tackle the different easy softball ones up here. Chat amongst yourselves, and I'll be back in a minute.